Hi guys and welcome back to my channel. I'm going to make the intro quick because we have a lot to get over, but I am going to be giving you an in-depth look on how to play the artist from Dead by Daylight. I was waiting for the mid-chapter update to pass to see if anything was going to change, but since Behavior hasn't announced any changes to the artist, we are good to go. This is a culmination of everything that I've learned over the last five months of playing her, and I hope you enjoy the video. To start off with, we have to understand how Birdie's power works. Her power is called the Birds of Torment, and it has two phases in terms of injury and survivors, and it is built in tracking and information when applying map pressure. When you press the power button, you are able to summon a Dire Crow, a minimum of two and a maximum of four depending on the add-ons that you bring, but you will typically spawn with three. The ability button launches the Dire Crows. There is a direct hit phase with the flight path of the crows, and a secondary hit phase that applies to the entire map if the survivors are swarmed. This is beneficial on large maps with predictable survivors, since sometimes the flight path isn't always a guarantee. Dire Crows stay idle for a amount of time and can inflict damage in the flight path about eight meters anything longer than that or if there's an obstacle in the way they turn into a swarm the aura of the swarm is white and will continue to show the, until the survivor begins repelling after that they show for two and a half seconds baseline or four seconds with velvet fabric which i'll go over more in the add-ons portion of the video when going throughout an environment the crows will reveal survivors with killer instinct this can be inconsistent but there are add-ons to widen the range if you have trouble fighting survivors initially or want a wider berth throughout the game crows can either be repelled instantly in lockers by having a flashlight shown on them for a few seconds or by using a flash Bang. This also works for idle crows as well. When it comes to timing, timing is key when playing the artist and even half a second can make or break a chase. Movement speed for crows is very fast, about twice as fast as a demo shred. It's 20 meters per second initially and then moves to 35 meters per second after 0.3 seconds. This makes cross maps really fun to go against since sometimes the speed is faster than a survivor can react. For reference, the only thing that is faster would be a fully charged huntress hatchet for context. Cooldown for firing applies in chases and this is why I discourage shooting off crows like a bot. You have one second cooldown before you can fire a crow, so when aiming, make sure you're going for where the survivor will end up and not where they are currently. A lot of the facts that I'll go over within this guide kind of ends up relating to medium length chases and swarm chases rather than actual direct hits with the flight path, mainly because nine times out of 10, the survivors are not gonna let you get a direct hit and you kind of have to adjust when you're going to be playing with it, within the survivors and within the swarms. There are factors like aura visibility and audio range for the survivors in relation to where the crows are being launched. Most survivors will listen for audio keys while in chase and things like aura visibility factor in where you place the crow and where the crow is being launched at the survivor. Idle timer applies to how long the dire crows will stay suspended in air before coming back to you. Some people have preferences whether they like shorter idle timers or longer ones. Shorter ones are nice for chases where survivors are just holding W around a map and you keep having to readjust your crows, but longer ones are great for really distinct setups and camping hooks. It's 10 seconds at the base, 12 seconds with chocolate corn add-on, and 14 seconds with still life crow. This will reset after placing another crow. Invincibility buffer is also another important one, so this applies to when the survivor is going to be hit next to the crow after being swarmed or hit. This is very useful for staggered hits, which I'll go over in the tips and tricks portion, but this applies to about 0.5 seconds or 80% of the gauge. When it comes to your crows, the crows themselves have different tidings depending on how many crows you shoot off at a time. The more crows you send off, the longer cooldown that you're going to have. The recharge from being idle is two seconds, and after firing off one dire crow, you have a five second cooldown, two dire crows is nine seconds, three dire crows is 12 seconds, and four dire crows is 14 seconds. Spacing is important for crows too. This is how far things have to be before placing a crow in an environment. It will spawn one meter from other crows. It's 10 meters from hook survivors. I see a lot of times birdie trying to use their crows around people who are hooked but you have to be 10 meters away it's two meters for exit gate switches and then it is one meter from hatch though that is kind of inconsistent and when it comes to killer instinct you will have three seconds of killer instinct or four and a half seconds with vibrant obituary which is a brown add-on repelling applies to survivors repelling after being swarmed in a medium to long chase you want to make sure that you have survivors swarmed as much as possible since they are further away from you you have an eight seconds of base repelling or eight and a half seconds with thick tar and you have a two and a half second for aura duration after the survivor starts repelling but if you bring velvet fabric, you have four seconds to know where they are moving and how to aim the next crow. When it comes to summoning, this information isn't fully relevant unless you're up close and personal with survivors, but it can be good to know when the cooldowns. You have a charge time of one second and it'll spawn two and a half meters from the artist. You have a half a second cooldown in between summons and you have a cooldown after firing of one and a half seconds where you are given a speed debuff. Sever tongue affects this cooldown by shaving off half a second. It's 1.5 to 1.75. It's a little bit inconsistent with that, but I've heard both answers. Now that we've gone over power and timing, it's time to get into chases and how to use it most effectively in a match. As a chase and information killer, she is very skilled at shutting down loops instantly. It's a catch-22, however, because it can be very difficult to get survivors to actually stick to a loop. Even very unsafe pallets in RPD can be dangerous to stick to, so survivors are more likely to W space in a match, which can be the downfall of the artist. When it comes to her flight path, we know that the flight path has a direct injury path of about 8 meters, which means that as long as there's nothing instructed in the path, the survivor will get injured. If there's anything in the way that has collision in it, it will turn into a swarm, so in tight quarters like Rancid 
or disturbed ward, it can ruin direct hits. Direct injuries are best safe for palace and jungle gems with clear line of sight. Anything after that, I tend to go for swarm attacks or normal M1s. With the swarm, I have a better chance of getting to play on the outside of the tile and pushing them into unsafe areas, or getting them without going through the actual loop itself. This can be useful for tricky main buildings or survivors that are W spacing around the map and are at a medium distance away. I find that maximum efficacy comes from medium range. This is where the artist is able to trump characters like Pyramid Head or Huntress because she can go through walls and difficult loops as long as you're able to actually predict how the survivors are going to move. You can elevate this gameplay with perks like I'm All Ears, Nurse's Calling, or her purple add-on Matias's Baby Shoes, which gives you a couple seconds of aura reading after placing a bird. With her power, you're able to shut down most loops and tiles pretty quickly, but because of that, survivors are less likely to actually loop and instead play it safe and try to waste time by running around the map and trying to break line of sight. This can be especially frustrating on large maps like Mother's Dwelling or maps with difficult elevation like Grim Pantry. In these situations, you're going to want to try and corral survivors like a sheepdog into tiles you know you can actually play on, rather than allowing them to run around the map and not actually loop. As a 115 killer, you're able to catch up and run tiles if you are unable to aim birds in the right direction. The downfall of the artist is the survivors who just W space around the map, so use your faster speed to your advantage. This is also beneficial if you have survivors who tend to respect your birds, causing you to either miss a shot or have them run back into you. Another big part of playing the artist is familiarizing yourself with map layouts and how survivors are going to loop. One of the reasons why I love RPD is because the map has a consistent layout, making it easier to predict where survivors are going to go. In the tips and tricks part, I'll touch up on why this is beneficial, not just in general killer gameplay, but when it comes to chain hits and corralling survivors into unsafe portions of the map. And then the most basic way to actually play her is place burb, keep survivor in area, corral survivor to burb, and collect profit. This is why she can be so frustrating because oftentimes it is a rock and a hard place when going against her. Perks and builds, this is where things start to get fun. I feel like Birdie has a power that fits in well with a lot of different perks. As a chase and information killer, you have a lot of flexibility to either elevate those factors of her power or do without and go for heavy hitty regression or end game perks because you'll be able to hold your own. I have a few builds that I'll talk about as a full recommendation, but I do go more in depth on perks and have a full tier list available if you'd like to see more. The best perks in my opinion have to do with chase and information, but this is across all the killers I play. Pressuring through quick chases, and making sure you have one survivor in your line of sight at all time is key within matches. With the artist, perks like Bitter Murmur, I'm All Ears, Nurse's Calling, Floods of Rage, and Barbecue are fantastic when it comes to knowing where to send your birds off to. She can even do well when it comes to heck defense. Being able to send off crows if you know where the survivors are in the area helps when it comes to defending totems and making sure that Devour or Ruin stays up in matches. This can be trickier in maps with multiple elevation, but in flatter maps, it's a great tool at your disposal. I have a few builds that I'll recommend in this portion. For a beginner burb, I'm going to recommend mainly or reading so that you can get used to sending off crows in chases. When you're first learning a killer, I don't recommend that you bring a lot of regression because you end up relying on the regression rather than relying on the skill of the killer. I love Lethal Pursuer for early game, Barbecue for information, I'm All Ears for in-game chases, and either Discordance to pair well with Severed Hands or as a gen defense perk, Bitter Murmur for when gens do get to completed, or Floods of Rage for continuous information throughout the match. Next I'm going to recommend is Barbecue, Blood Favor, Iron Maiden, and I'm All Ears, or Pain Res for gen defense. Blood Favor is such a fun hex to use because oftentimes people try to camp pallets or bait the drop in with your crows. For my own build, I tend to lead towards Barbecue, Lightborn, Lethal Pursuer, or Discordance, and Pain Res as my one regression. I enjoy having a nice early game since it has great pressure and often has me feel a little bit more confident within my matches, because even though Birdie has built in Lethal Pursuer with her ability to find survivors at gens, Lethal takes a guessing game out and allows you to set up trick shots in the beginning. If I'm bringing Severed Hands, I love pairing it with Discordance since it can be super helpful and fun to use while in games. Again, because her powers are so flexible, I think that the builds depend on your playstyle and whether you want a lot of regression, chase, information, or a combination between the two. One of the things I do recommend though when you are trying to learn the artist is not bringing a lot of regression. I did say this earlier, but you want to get comfortable with how the survivors are moving. That way you feel more comfortable as you start to add in the heavier hurting perks and as your MMR goes up. Bringing the aura reading will really help you out because you want to watch and see how the survivors are moving before you're kind of shooting off crows blindly. Because a lot of the counterplay to the artist is W spacing and breaking line of sight, you're going to want to get used to how survivors are running and how to predict them better. That way when they do run away from you, you're still able to hold your own. In terms of add-ons, I will admit that Birdie doesn't have my favorite add-ons amongst most of the killers. Oftentimes I go without because add-ons don't affect the gameplay that much. I do have favorites and I'm not saying they're all bad, but don't feel pressured to bring them. Unlike killers like Blight, Pinhead, Sadako, or Clown, the add-ons don't drastically change your gameplay. My favorites though include Severed Hands, which swarms survivors who are near each other when swarmed, Festering Carry-On, which takes away half a second of your cooldown after shooting off a crow, Silver Bell, which inflicts the oblivious 
status effect, Ogrifo Lover, which inflicts the Exhausted status effect, and Thorny Nest, which is her Sloppy Butcher equivalent add-on. I do have a few combinations of my favorite add-ons that I enjoy. Festering Carry-On and Severed Hands is usually my go-to, but I enjoy Festering Carry-On and Severed Tongue, which increases the speed cooldown that the artist gets after setting off a crow, so it's very quick when you're in chase. The Fear Manga combo includes Darkest Ink and Ogrifo Old Lover, which can be really fun in active chases if the survivor has Windows, Bonds, or any sort of exhaustion perk. Darkest Ink is the blindness status effect whenever they are swarmed, and it does persist for 15 seconds after they've repelled. I don't get much value out of her Eerie add-ons since they're not good in my opinion, but Eerie Feather with Ink Egg gives you a super long cooldown if you want to take advantage of the undetectable status effect. It's not very good for actually using your crows, but it can be good for some spooky time in-game. And Garden of Rot and Severed Hands gives you the opportunity to have multiple explosive survivors for at once. This pairs really well with Stabiffle, but I don't often get much value out of Garden of Rot once they figure out I have it. To get value out of Garden of Rot, you kind of need to be in an open or dead area and be right up on the survivor's back. However, once they know that you have this, they are least likely to actually repel and just take the extra health state. So that's why I don't recommend relying on this add-on. If you're new to the artist, I'm going to recommend Velvet Fabric and Thick Tar. This causes the survivors to have a longer repelling time, and Velvet Fabric will show the aura for a total of four seconds, which will help you get used to sending off crows and how the survivors are going to act when repelling. Most of the time, they're going to go one way and either still or fake it and go back to where they were initially. So you kind of want to almost create like a little V if you are unused to where the survivors are going to be moving. Most of her purple and green add-ons are a safe bet from the status effects to the quality of life changes during cooldown, so you can't particularly go wrong with them. I don't recommend Ink Egg. That's probably my least favorite one out of her purple add-ons, but for the rest of them, you are fine to bring them once you get comfortable with her playstyle. I definitely recommend playing around with what you like best and what fits with how you play Birdie. What works for me might not work for you. And if you want to use your crows for information rather than chasing or camping hooks, if you want a wider amount of pressure, which I'm not going to encourage, of course, but you do have the add-ons to allow you to do so. When it comes to chases, Birdie at her core is an anti-loop and recon killer. She is able to apply pressure to an entire map and keep tab on survivors, whether she's in chase at as a killer or a patrolling gens. Loops and chases are definitely my favorite part about playing killer, and it can result in some super fun tactics and a way to get around survivors in-game. Because Birdie is an anti-loop killer, survivors will oftentimes not stick to loops because they don't want to get stuck within a rock in a hard place. This is definitely the downfall of the artist because if it's a rep map or if survivors are unpredictable, you can feel like you're running around like a chicken with your head cut off. You can either combat this by using your crows as herding dogs to corral survivors into different loops, or by setting up staggered hits by lining up a crow with the pallet, placing another crow in that pallet, and letting a survivor either the walk into the crow so that the first one hits them. It's not foolproof, but it's pretty fun to do. When it comes to tiles, each one has a few different ways to counterplay it. I am going to discourage placing crows in the direct view of the window unless you have a clear line of sight on the survivor and can take time well enough to actually hit them. One of the biggest ways that I talk about how you're going to run loops is what I've been calling the diagonal method. This is where you're going to be placing crows and having the flight path either hit them throughout the jungle gym or you're going to be placing the crows at junctions either at corners or really important spots like doors and windows. That way you know that the survivor is going to run into the flight path. This works best for shack, TL walls, or like long wall jungle gyms. The weird Yamaoka tiles or the four walls can be a little bit difficult and it really depends on how the survivor is running them. But oftentimes if you struggle with those, I recommend placing it at the window and for them to vault, but the diagonal method is kind of what I end up using nine times out of ten, especially if I can actually get them to stick to a loop. Pallets are definitely the easiest thing to play on as the artist. Most pallets are relatively unsafe and have different ways that you can play them. I've seen people recommend placing a crow in the middle and a crow on the edge so that you can get survivors to go towards a certain side, but this wastes too much time and allows survivors to leave the loop, which is the opposite of what you want. I do recommend the middle crow, but I often like placing the crows long ways of a tile so that when they vault or throw the pallet, it often results in a down or a hit. I mentioned crow timing earlier, but one thing I like to do in chases is make sure that I always have a crow on survivor I'm chasing. To save time, if I can get crows on them and then M1 them, I can usually get a down as they're running away from me. Another nice thing I like to do is force survivors to do a fax action, such as throwing a pallet down, vaulting, or dead harding. So whenever they have the crows on them, you can keep them on them as they're trying to run away from you. Another thing I talk about in my streams a lot is staggered hits. This was a relatively simple thing to discover in the PTB, but it's really, really fun to do. Technically, you can also do an entire down with the ink egg add-on, but it requires the survivor even standing still or the biggest brain in the game, but it is pretty fun to actually pull off. A lot of times I do get people who ask me how staggered hits work and the easiest way to do it is just once you've placed a crow and keep walking forward, you kind of want to make sure that they're in the same line of path because the crows are going to hide behind each other. So once the survivor gets hit with the crow initially, they don't have a lot of a reaction time and you're able to get them with the second crow that's behind them. And if you don't know what 80% of the gauge is, just wait for the gauge to touch the number of how many crows you have remaining and it'll be a lot easier. My biggest advice while in chase is to be patient. For the first few games as the artist, focus on feeling comfortable with your crows rather than winning the game. It's easy to lean into M1ing, but you want to familiarize yourself with how survivors are moving 
moving, how they typically run tiles, and what you can do to better yourself in chases and be more prepared to actually go against them. And then finally, for tips and tricks, here are some of the things that I wish I knew when I first started playing the artist. Don't be afraid to be creative with the crows. If you can't get direct hits, then focus on her herding technique and getting survivors into unsafe areas that you can play on. With survivors, they're more likely to run away from the flight path, so you can use it to get them away from tiles you don't want to play on or you're not comfortable playing on. It's tempting to bring the best stuff, but if you want to get good at her, use her base kit, no slowdowns, and take your time in matches. You want to get comfortable with her power before you start adding things under her base kit, and if you try to go too hard too fast, you're just going to end up relying on things that you shouldn't be relying on. When it comes to the idle timer and whether to wait it off or shoot off crows, I recommend waiting it now if you've brought Untitled Agony, which reduces the cooldown time that they disintegrate by half a second, so they come back basically instantly if you place more than two crows and half the gauge is already depleted. When it comes to maps with varied elevation, it can be rough to a beginner artist since the crows will either not follow the flight path, go above or below survivors, or just be inconsistent with how they're going to hit them, which is the case with either of the swamp maps in my opinion. In these situations, stick to the middle of the map and try to corral survivors off of the lip. This is a lot easier to play on since the terrain is friendlier, but the heights do also transfer. You can go from the dock height to the top of main buildings if you want, so you can actually use it to your advantage. Crows travel up and down stairs, which is beneficial in maps like RPD or Thompson House, or even when people are going for basement unhooks. Lockers are interesting because they're annoying when survivors use them to instantly repel, but this is also why I recommend Iron Maiden on builds because it can be a nice surprise for some cheeky survivors. But the nice thing is, is that you get killer instinct when survivors are hiding in lockers, just like Legion, so you can test it to see where the survivors are hiding, especially if it's towards the end game or if you're just really confused at where someone is in an area. If you find yourself getting frustrated and thinking you can't hit anything, it's okay. You are not going to win every match, even the best killers have matches where they're going to get outplayed, and this happens to me all the time. As much as I love Birdie, she is not infallible, she is not nurse, she is not blight, she still has her own weaknesses. She's a very satisfying killer to learn, but if you think that you're going to win every single match, I am so sorry it's not going to happen. This is the nature of the game. Focus on different win conditions rather than trying to get kills or pub stomp in lobbies. And again, if you have any more questions about the artist or if there are things that I didn't touch up on, feel free to talk to me on Twitch. I go live throughout the week and I have a link down below. I'm always happy to answer questions about Birdie and I appreciate the love and support.